So we are about to start. Uh, I hope that everyone can hear me and see me. If you can do so, you can write OK in the chat so that I know that everyone can hear me and that the audio is OK. Awesome. Thank you. So good morning and welcome to the PRT Soul North and Chapter, Chapter Full Day Conference, Rebooting the Classroom. Uh, we hope that today's conference helps you get new ideas to incorporate into your classroom. Uh, we know that it has been a very difficult semester for all educators worldwide. We want to thank you for your contribution to the island, to the students, and to the community. Your teaching creates a great impact in our society. Um, educators are the backbone of our society. We guide, form, and empower future professionals. So thank you. We also want to thank and acknowledge PRT Soul's past president and board members that are joining us today. Thank you for being here. For today, our schedule is going to be uh, quite simple. We're going to have three presenters for today. Uh, from 10.15 to 11.20, we're going to have the presentation Games and Media in the Classroom from Theory to Practice by Dr. Johansen Quijano. From 11.20 to 12.30, we're going to have Foundation for Building Phonological and Phonemic Awareness, Phonetic Instruction Strategies by our very own Rosemary Morales. And from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m., we're going to be Seeing the presentation, creating interactive classes, using Nearpod for a synchronous and synchronous classroom. We ask for you to join us at 1.35 from 2 p.m. to participate in our raffle. We are going to be giving out a free uh, gift for those of you that join us during that time. So again, thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm going to ask Naomi to present, to introduce our presenter for today. Naomi, please unmute your mic. We cannot hear okay. you. Oh, I thought that. Yeah. Okay. Now. Good morning. This is Naomi Vega. And I would like to introduce Dr. Johansen Quijano, who was a past president of the Metro chapter several years ago. Mm -hmm. Johansen Quijano is an associate professor of English at Tarrant Con County College in Texas where he teaches courses on writing, rhetoric, literature, critical thinking, writing game, writing and games, and social media. Dr. Quijano earned a PhD in rhetoric from the University of Texas at Arlington, where he also lectures on rhetoric and technical communication as an active professor. He holds two graduate degrees from the University of Puerto Rico, one in English literature and the other in education, and a focus on the teaching of English as a second language. He has published several articles and chapters on gaining theory and criticism, educational technology, and ludic narrative. His book, The Compositions of Video Games, is a rhetorical explo exploration of games as a medium. In it, Dr. Quijano looks at the narrative ludic, oral, oral, and visual dimensions of games and how, how it is contingent on design, either work with or against each other to convey ideas. He's a, he has explored these ideas in the classroom, which he, where he uses video games to help students master writing competencies and rhetorical techniques and critical thinking skills. He, also, he has also used games in the literature classroom, where he encourages students to draw parallels between the ideas presented in stories and poetry and those conveyed by video games. 
He is currently working on a manuscript for an upcoming book that dissects and critically analyzes representations of gender in all the mainline Final Fantasy titles. He has also worked with various organizations to host video game related events to raise awareness of various causes, including mental health, social isolation, personal disenfranchisement, and how games can help in improving the conditions of members of the community. And we welcome Johansson. We're really happy to have you uh, contributing to PRT. So once again, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, Dr. Vega. Uh, and uh, thank you for putting everything together and uh, coordinating uh, Dr. Morales. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen, uh, which should be this one. And uh, can all of you see my slides now? Yes, we can see them. All right, perfect. Um, so today I'll be talking about games and media in the language classroom. Uh, like Dr. Vega mentioned, uh, I do research not just in education, but also in uh, rhetoric, game design, uh, user interface, etc. But I'd like to focus on education and more specifically in uh, what I've done in the language classroom, what works for me, and hopefully you can get some uh, ideas that you can implement in your own classrooms. So what we're going to do today is uh, look briefly at the historical background of using games in the classroom. Uh, we're going to look at theory and research. Then I'll talk a little bit about the research that I've been doing as well as my ongoing research into education. Uh, and then I'll talk about what has worked for me personally, what I'm trying to do, and some ideas that uh, I hope to bring to the classroom uh, next semester. And then we'll wrap up with a Q&A. And so, um, the idea of using video games in education uh, goes back well before 2003, but it was also uh, it was actually in 2003 uh, with James Paul Geese, what video games have to teach us about learning and literacy, that they got to the forefront of educational uh, discourse. In this book, uh, he presented 36 principles of game design. These are concepts that video games implement to teach players how to engage with the game that he felt educa educators could learn from. So for example, the design principle is one of the ones that uh, he identifies. He talks about how players become deeply familiar with the design of the game while playing the game. And if that doesn't sound like immersive learning, I don't know what does, right? When we are uh, learning a second language, for example, or even a language skill, whether it's writing, listening, and so on, it's not enough to just talk about it in the abstract. We have to actually engage with it. So that's one of the principles that Guy identified. Um, I don't know how many of you, um, and I'm going to draw from my own experience here, uh, took English in public school, um, you know, perhaps before the 2000s. I went to high school 1995 to 1998, and a lot of my English classes were framed in Spanish. The teacher would start with, Buenos dias todo el mundo, como están? Hoy vamos a hablar de la gramática en inglés. And then they would give us a sentence written in English in the board, and then would, they would dissect it, you know, here's a noun, here's a pronoun, and so on. But everything would be done in Spanish, right? So... Uh, if we follow the design principle, then instead of doing that kind of decontextualized grammar analysis, what we should be doing is immersing students in the language. Uh, he identified the community learning principle, where players commit to continually learn. Um, and this has more to do with intrinsic motivation and the motivation to continually engage with uh, in the concept, in the context of Guy's book, *The Game*, and then of course in the context of education, with becoming a lifelong learner. This is something that we, as instructors, need to instill in our students. Learning doesn't stop at the end of you know high school or college. 
uh, they are continually learning and continually growing as human beings. Uh, he identified the ongoing learning principle, which is when the game consistently pushes the players to learn. And he identifies this as the I plus one principle, where the game will meet the players at their current skill level and then add a little bit of challenge. And so he uses a game called Mega Man for this example. Um, the player begins at the screen and there are no prompts. Uh, the player has to look at the controller and figure out what it does, move left or right. So as the player begins moving right, the game launches one enemy at the player. So the player will have to figure out what the buttons do, shoot lemons, jump, etc. Um, once a player has mastered the skill of defeating that one enemy, well, the game will then give the player a platform to jump on. Then the next uh, challenge will be a platform with enemies and so on and so forth. So the game principle is that whatever skill the player has mastered will build on top of it. And that in education translates to scaffolding, uh, having students learn skills, practice them, and then build on them uh, to create ever more complex structures, whether it's writing, speech, etc. And then of course you identify the multimodal principle uh, which is that learning is done not just through one form of communication, but through all of them. There are, um, you know, people who learn better through oral uh, learning, others learn visually, and so on and so forth, right? So um, there are some further readings that I'm going to link in the chat at the end when I do have access to the chat. Uh, when I started sharing the screen, it kind of went away. Uh, but I will post all those links in the chat in case you're interested in reading a little bit more about Gee's work. And so after that book in 2003, it kind of prompted a quote unquote golden age of research into education. So you had, for example, Kurt Squire, who wrote an article called Video Games and Education, published in the International Journal of Intelligence, Simulations and Gaming. And that was more a kind of general exploration of how video games could be implemented in the classroom. Uh, it was a kind of what if. Um, you know, for example, he would say that language teachers could implement role playing games. Um, and I like to think that he borrowed that from my own early research. Or that science teachers could implement physics based games. And then he would use examples and so on. Um, and Ian Bogos later in 2005 uh, made a similar argument with video games and the future of education, um, except that his was more along the lines of a hypothetical future in which some of the more engaging and thoughtfully crafted video games would exist in classrooms, specifically in language arts classrooms, alongside the works of Shakespeare, Blake, Chaucer, etc. So uh, you could have, uh, Bogus argues in, in this article, uh, students write, for example, a poem by uh, William Blake or Wordsworth, uh, and then compare that to a video game rendition of the ideas that those poems would present. Um, later on, uh, Mark uh, Prensky said in Don't Bother Me Mom, I'm Learning, uh, that computers and video games uh, actually help uh, children specifically, was the focus of his book, become quote-unquote smarter. Uh, now, interestingly, he doesn't give us an exact definition of what smarter means, but he talks about how video games help players master things like problem-solving skills and critical thinking throughout the whole book. And then, um, you know, some of my own uh, research, uh, I'd like to include it here. Uh, when I looked at video games in the ESL classroom specifically, uh, I did a lot of comparative studies, A-B studies. So um, I would have one group of students go through the standard curriculum, another group of students go through a modified version in which they would, for example, play a video game and do a book report on the video game instead of a book. Um, and what I found is that 
uh, students were far more engaged with the video game their analyses were more thorough deeper more thoughtful and so on um, and this kind of research went on till about 2012 right so you have uh, uh, Thomas uh, Christopher Thomas Miller with games purpose and potential in education this was another kind of hypothetical think piece and then Leonard Donetta with uh, video games and education why they should be used and how they're being used this was more of a discussion on how teachers in various disciplines were using video games in 2008 and again I will link to each of these in the chat all right so uh, Mark Prensky kind of gathered all of the uh, all of these ideas and uh, wrote the book Digital Game-Based Learning, in which he asks the questions, number one, what role do games have in training? Uh, specifically, he focuses on professional spaces, so things like banking, for example, law, medicine, and he uses a lot of examples uh, of games like Objection. This is a simulator uh, used in several uh, law schools, uh, MIT, Harvard, etc., uh, to get first-year uh, law students to have simulated classroom experience, right, like simulated legal experience, uh, uh, you know, in a virtual courtroom. Uh, he talks about how several uh, schools of medicine are using simulations to train their students and so on. Uh, but then he also explores how can games be used in the classroom. And here he talks about not just using video games to expose students to uh, language, science, etc., but also on creating activities that revolve around games. Uh, an example for a language classroom activity could be to have students write a top 10 list where they argue uh, why each of the games that they mention belongs in a certain spot. Or uh, for a visual arts or graphic arts class to have students create new cover art for video games. In a science classroom to have students use games like Minecraft, for example, uh, to explore biomes or to create biomes or to use games like Second Life, which I don't know how many of you are familiar with Second Life, but they have a virtual rendition of the Globe Theater, a virtual rendition of Versailles. And so he talks about uh, taking groups of students virtually on these kinds of uh, digital tours uh, so that you can explore uh, the history and literature of the times in those video games. Now, that being said, I should point out that Second Life uh, is not as education friendly now as it used to be when it was launched. So if you do want to go into Second Life, you might want to do a little bit of exploration first. There are some uh, questionable parts in that game space. Uh, granted, they are separate from the educational ones. If you go to, for example, uh, the campus of the University of Texas on Second Life, you're not going to find any kind of CD stuff. But once you move outside of that area, then you might bump into some of that more questionable content. Right? So, Prensky asks, uh, do games change the mechanics of teaching and learning? He comes at the conclusion that they don't, they simply enhance them. Uh, teaching and learning is always about having a kind of student-centric perspective, doing what's best for students, and uh, having students engage in practice, transference of skills. So it goes beyond the lecture. And uh, Prensky jumps off the point that good teaching is not just lecturing, it's actually having more of a hands-on experience. And so when games say that in order to learn things, or when they suggest rather, that in order to learn things, you need to have a hands-on approach, Prensky says, well, of course, that's good teaching. Um, you know, he explores who are the digital natives, which uh, nowadays is pretty much everyone 
uh, why are video games so engaging? He explores the medical uh, side of things, the kind of dopamine rush, the kind of competitive nature, the engaging narratives, and so on. And finally, he wraps up with a couple of questions that I think are some of the most important ones for any educator who wants to use games in their classroom to ask. That is, how do we evaluate games for learning? And we're actually going to look at that uh, in a little bit later on. Right now, based on this, um, educators like Harry Brown went crazy. Uh, they said, well, what about exploring video games in all contexts? So uh, he explored video games in storytelling, video games in aesthetic, in film studies, uh, politics in video games, ethics in video games, and so on and so forth. And What's interesting is that, uh, especially in his ethics and politics uh, chapter, he takes a more nuanced view of these concepts than just assuming, uh, you know, partisan politics or ethics as in what's right or what's wrong. Instead, he takes the assumption that uh, everything is political. So, for example, when a game decides to use what's called a Skinner box mechanic uh, where you go back every day and you click on a button and then you get the daily rewards that is a political choice that the game designer is making um, and an ethical one because these kinds of designs have been known to cause some minor degree of addiction similar to gambling right so he questions that kind of uh, design choice uh, refers to it as somewhat unethical um, and contextualizes it within the politics of the day. Uh, he explores how religion is represented in video games, he explores race and so on, um, and this is actually one of the more compelling books, um, and I will put the link to a couple of summaries again in the chat once I have access to it. And so Based on all this research into video games and learning, uh, we come up with three forms of uh, game-based learning. The first one is tangential learning. Um, I was first exposed to this in a YouTube video of all things, uh, where Daniel Floyd, he was originally a game designer, then he went to work as an animator in Disney, then he became a consultant uh, for games for an, uh, games and education startup. Uh, he says that play is nature's way of getting us to learn and that games cannot be forced uh, on someone for them to be effective. Right? And this is absolutely true. If you force someone to play, if you coerce them into it, it will not be enjoyable. They will become resistant to learning. But if you give students the option of playing, and this is what I'm a big advocate of, giving students the option, uh, they'll become more open, more enthusiastic about it, and then this resonates both uh, with the early research that I did into games and language learning, as well as what I've observed in class, uh, you know, when I came over to Texas and I started teaching Comp 1, Comp 2, tech writing, uh, game studies, etc. And so, uh, tangential learning, uh, he explains, is the process of just showing a player something that they might be interested in and letting the player figure out what it is on his or her own account, on their own account. Uh, so they go ahead and do further research. Uh, the example that he uses, I'm not a very big fan of. He talks about how in a very popular video game, Final Fantasy VII, there's a character, which we see here, uh, the guy with the angel. Uh, he's called Sephiroth. And so Daniel says, well, here's this character called Sephiroth. Uh, people are now just going to go off and do research and learn a lot about, uh, you know, the tree of life, which is the Sephiroth in Jewish mythology, and so on and so forth. I'm not so much a fan of that example. Uh, so instead, okay, we... Um, yes? Does anyone have a question? I think I hear someone. All right, just some background noise. Um, so instead, we're going to look at uh, these uh, four games that we have here. SimCity, for example, uh, is a world-building, a city-building game in which 
never actually started. All right. Okay, let's see. Um, is there any way to mute? No. Okay. There. Thank you. Uh, so let's see. SimCity. It's a city building game uh, in which players have to become familiar with things like economics, taxing, zoning laws, etc. At least in the uh, PC, the computer-based SimCity games. Um, there's actually a story in one of James Paul Gee's books um, where he talks about how he was playing SimCity and his nephew, a seven-year-old kid, was watching him play over the shoulder. And he was stumped because he couldn't get workers in a particular section of the city that he was building to stop striking. And after 30 minutes of watching him play, the nephew said, if you raise the taxes on the banking sector and use those taxes to improve infrastructure on the working class se sector, sector, they will stop striking. And so Guy did that, and that's indeed what happened in the game. Um, so here we have a seven-year-old talking about taxation with his uh, then 45-year-old uncle, right? So that was an interesting story. Uh, we have the Oregon Tale, with the Trail, which is a game that uh, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with. Um, you take the role of a couple of settlers, and you need to travel to Oregon. Uh, you, you meet with bankers. You need to scavenge for food. Sometimes your wagon breaks down, and it's a very kind of language-heavy game. Uh, all of your interactions happens through... Uh, language in the keyboard so you have to type in your actions um, and then the game responds accordingly usually you die of dysentery in the way uh, there's never alone it's a game uh, done by an Alaskan tribe in which you play a platform game uh, the aesthetics of the game are based on uh, the myths of the uh, Alaskan natives and at the end of every stage, you get a clip of one of the elders talking about what's happening in that particular myth that you just played through. And then Papers, Please is also a game that's really good with this kind of tangential game-based learning uh, methodology. It's a game in which you take the role of a uh, guard uh, at a border and you need to screen people who want to come into your country based on their documents, passports, and other kind of language and visual cues that you see. Um, and so these games all uh, expose players to different types of information. And then based on those very specific examples, players, if they are interested, can go out and further explore. Um, another good example is Plague Inc. I added this slide um, recently. I don't know why I've forgotten it when I was originally making this slide, but it's a game where you take the role of a pathogen and your role is to infect the world. So it, it, it takes a spin on the COVID-19 video game. There's actually a game where you take the role of the CDC you need to stop the COVID infection. In this one, you create a plague. And the purpose of this game is to help players understand how pathogens spread and evolve. So it's not so much a game that wants to be uh, kind of sadistic. It's not a game that, uh, you know, go kill people for fun or anything like that. No, it, it actually has an educational purpose. But it's so well hidden behind the fun game mechanics that players don't even notice that they are learning while they are learning, right? So here we see an example of tangential learning starting to lean into game-based learning, right? So we have tangential learning as one of the three forms of kind of game-based education. Uh, we also have gamification. This term was allegedly called uh, coined by Nick Pelling. Uh, he says that it's applying a game like accelerated user interface uh, designed to make electronic transactions both enjoyable and fast. But I say allegedly coined because 
the earliest reference that I've found of him actually using the term is a story that he published in 2011 saying, hey, back in the day in 2002, I coined this term. But before that, in 2007, there's actually a blog post by uh, a game designer called Brett Terrell who talks about uh, gamification as adding a game-based layer on top of uh, everyday activity. Uh, and then the term was later popularized by Jim McGonagall in Reality is Broken. Um, and what gamification would look like in the classroom is by, for example, uh, changing a grading schema from one where students earn grades based on averages, right, 90%, 80%, and so on, into one where they level up as they accomplish tasks. And so the task would still be that they have to participate in class, that they have to submit homework assignments or write essays or uh, do role plays in the classroom, whatever your class looks like, you wouldn't have to change the mechanics of learning, right? Going back to Guy. Uh, what changes is how you present the assessment. So after, for example, earning um, 100 or 120 points or however you want to define uh, your uh, grading scale, students level up. And so they start in level one. And if they want to earn a C in class, they need to get to level 10. If they want to earn a B, they need to get to level 15. And if they want to earn an A, they need to get to level 20. Right? And so we're going to talk a little bit more about how I've done that in the classroom in a little bit. Right? And then we have formal game-based learning, which is the third kind of game-based educational approach uh, that arose from all of this research into games. And so the difference between game-based learning and gamification, a lot of people think they're the same thing, but they're not. Uh, in game-based learning, it's the instructional method that uses games to teach a specific outcome. So you're actually playing while you learn. Whereas in gamification, you don't actually have to play. You just need to have game-like components in the assessment of the outcome. So for example, uh, video games have things like achievements or badges or leaderboards. If you implement that in your classroom, you are gamifying it. But if you want to fully integrate games into the course, if you want to, for example, play Jenga or have your students play a round robin debate, both of which we'll talk about in a little bit, now you're doing game-based learning. Essentially, the game either is the content or is a conduit for the content, whereas gamification is more of an engagement uh, mechanic. All right. And so, uh, to talk a little bit about my own research, uh, like I mentioned early on, I was looking specifically at ESL students in Puerto Rico, um, you know, that, that was during my graduate studies and then later when I was teaching at Centro de Estudios Multidisciplinarios. Um, and I did a lot of A-B studies. I did a lot of uh, student surveys, interviews, and so on. Uh, they were published in Pedagogia. That's a journal for EPR and journals like Paideia and so on. Um, and what I found uh, is that there's a lot more enthusiasm when students are given the choice of play games, of, of playing games, than when they're forced to play games. Uh, and even more so than when they are told that they cannot, right? So that option being there gets students excited about the language. Uh, I found that when you use video games uh, as a tool, students engage more deeply with the concepts especially when we're talking about things like literary analysis, character analysis, and so on. Uh, so consistently, I noticed that uh, students who were asked to uh, analyze characters from short stories, they were very surface level. And when students were asked to analyze uh, characters from video games, they were pretty deep analysis. Um, I would argue that even going further and deeper than the game actually intended for the characters to be. So the students actually gave the characters an added layer of dimensionality. Um, and then some of my more re more recent studies uh, that I've done here in Texas, 
Uh, I focus on first and second year college students. Um, I don't do educational research with my grad students. Um, but my students are really diverse, to give you a little bit of context. I get uh, usually uh, about 50% of my students are ELLs, English, English language learners. Um, and then I get maybe 10, 15% who are uh, developmental level students, uh, native speakers, but they're the developmental uh, level uh, for language skills. And then the rest of the students are what you would call a college ready student. And so it's in that context that I started implementing video games. Now I'm not allowed uh, for both legal and institutional policy reasons to completely redo my course into an ELL course. Um, I have to focus on, for example, in first year composition, in the first part, teaching argument, critical thinking, and, and, and writing. And then for the second part, to focus on writing about literature. So my most recent research uh, was doing that kind of, you know, A-B study. Uh, one group of students would play through several games and think about rhetorical concepts, arguments, uh, you know, language skills, etc. Whereas the other group, the uh, control group, would just get the standard curriculum, uh, you know, standard classical argument, Rogerian, etc. They would each have pre post tests. Um, and what I found is that when it comes to rhetorical knowledge, argument structures, and indeed the command of language in the case of ELLs, uh, it improved at a faster and more thorough rate with the students who were asked to think about those concepts as they played through video games than for students who were not. Um, and then I have a forthcoming uh, article where I do the same with my uh, lit students uh, where we would read Walden and then we would play through Walden or we would look at the elements of literature focusing on narrative structure and then we would play through the Stanley Parable, a video game that's heavily narrative uh, but that changes the structure based on player action. Or we would read poetry and then play through a video game called Flower in which you as a player takes control of the wind and you go around collecting flower petals and deposit them at the end of the stage to kind of revitalize uh, a dead space into a lush green scenery. Um, and so I'm currently crunching the data, but the early analyses, what they show, um, is that there is a deeper level of understanding of literary concepts. When students look at these ideas, both in traditional texts and in video games, than when we only look at these concepts in uh, short stories, poems, etc. Then um, what I'm noticing, which is going to be my forthcoming research perhaps for the next uh, two or three years, uh, is that when students use what we call writerly video games, so things like Kind Words, Elegy for a Dead World, both of which we're going to look at it in a little bit um, and create story based games using things like RPG Maker or Twine, Renpy, etc. Uh, their growth in writing is more sustained and faster right, at a higher rate than students who don't use these kinds of texts. Pardon, let me take a sip of water here. So I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, each of these uh, forms of kind of game-based education. The first one is for gamifying the course. And so here you see a lot of kind of game references, but this is actually for a composition course, um, a uh, writing and literature course. And you'll notice that instead of having percentages here, I have points. And for students to level up, to the D, they need to earn 600 points. For them to level up to the C, they need to earn 700 points. And if you're thinking, but that looks just like 90%, 80%, yes, in the background, that is exactly what's happening. But I make it more transparent for students. I give them a kind of level up uh, structure. They become more engaged in it. So when they finish each of the major papers, they earn 120 points. 
And then there are short assignments worth a total of 600 points, uh, 75 points per lesson unit um, for a total of 1,200 points. Now, the Astute Observer, which now that is all of you, will have noticed that 1,200 points and 900 points, that's not 90%. And that is absolutely correct. This is closer to 88%, right? So if students want to get an A, uh, they need to earn 88% of the total points. If they want to get a B, uh, they earn about 75% of the total points and so on and so forth. This is not, however, uh, making the course easier on them because in order for them to earn these 1200 points they would need to complete all five major papers plus the short assignments uh, in most writing courses uh, the recommended pedagogy is that students write four major papers plus whatever short assignments so in order for them to get that a they can either get perfect scores in four major papers and rock the short assignments or if they don't do that well then they have the opportunity of uh, getting to that higher grade by completing the fifth assignment um, and i tailor this after the kind of open world game design i don't know how many of you are familiar with that kind of game but you're giving an open world and then you can explore specific places in the world to follow through the main story or you can go off to the side and do some meaningless quest about finding a flower for a farmer right so um and that helps your character grow and so when i uh, structure my lessons and my uh, scoring schema uh, i take that into consideration these short assignments perhaps any kind of extra credit stuff those would be the side quests quote unquote uh, but for them to pass, they do have to complete the major papers, at least four of the five major papers. Uh, plus, it gives them opportunity to uh, what we call successfully fail in game studies, right? So they have the freedom to fail without feeling the pressure of uh, thinking that if they get a bad grade in one paper, they're going to fail the class, right? So that doesn't happen with this kind of grading schema. And then moving to a little bit more game-based learning. Uh, here's one of the strategies that I like to use. Uh, and there are two takes on this. Um, I can either put questions on Jenga blocks related to uh, the class. So for example, define ethos. And then a student would pull the block, define ethos. And then they would have to talk about credibility and the speaker and ethics and so on. Uh, they would pull another block define Rogerian rhetoric. Well, Rogerian rhetoric is the approach to argument where you try to negotiate and find a happy point and so on. Or, alternatively, you can have different towers for different groups and you can ask them questions for a, from a PowerPoint. This is something that if we were face to face we would be doing. Uh, you can ask them questions from either a PowerPoint or from note cards and if they get the answer right, they don't pull any blocks. If they get the answer wrong, they pull blocks and uh, whoever uh, drops their tower first loses, whoever keeps their tower up at the end, then maybe they get like a point for their final paper, um, you know, to kind of reinforce that kind of active engagement with some uh, extrinsic motivation as well as the intrinsic motivation of the game itself. Uh, something else that I like to do is a kind of round robin gamified debate. Uh, so I will, uh, I will divide students into five, six groups. And what I'll do is that I'll ask the students of the first group a question. They will answer. And then I'll ask students from groups number two all the way through five if they agree with that, if they think that's a correct answer. If everyone does, then the students from group number one earn points. We move forward. If they don't, then we have a debate. And it's pretty standard stuff uh, in the debate. Uh, the students will have 30 seconds to prepare and explain to the classmates why they think their answer is the correct one. I like to uh, make all of my questions kind of open-ended so they're more about application rather than having an exact correct answer. And so they'll debate. I will let the, their classmates decide on the answer. 
um, and then we'll move on to group number two and so on. We'll have that kind of round robin debate. Um, and then at the end, uh, I will share what I think are my answers, what, 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 you know, from my perspective are the quote unquote correct answers for applications with them and I will give them my rationale. Right? And then as far as using games in the classroom, uh, like actual video games, what we need to consider is first, is the game well designed? Uh, this has to do with whether the game crashes or not, whether uh, the game actually works, uh, is the game fun to play. So here we're moving into whether it's engaging or not. Uh, we need to think about the game's underlying message, of course. Uh, there are a lot of uh, games, like I mentioned earlier, that have questionable content. For example, um, I would not want uh, junior high school students playing Grand Theft Auto. Right? I would not want any kind of student playing Postal or Hatred. These are games where you take the role of a character and you just shoot everyone for fun, right? So that's not the kind of message that I want to give. Uh, instead, I give them games that are more along the lines of, uh, you know, high fantasy. Um, you know, something that would be like the video game form of perhaps Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, uh, perhaps visual novels, or perhaps games that... Uh, further a cause of social justice, some of which we'll be looking in a little bit. Uh, so what does the game teach, if it even teaches anything? Um, of course, every game teaches you how to play it, but uh, when it comes to Tetris, for example, it doesn't really teach you any kind of skills beyond hand-eye coordination and perhaps kind of spatial awareness. That's not very useful for a language class. But when we look at games like, for example, Final Fantasy, uh, which uh, Dr. Vega mentioned uh, in, in the introduction, the book that I'm working on, uh, Final Fantasy is a language heavy game with lots of reading, lots of recorded conversations. Uh, there's, there are a lot of elements of lore uh, and mythology. So that's a game that when framed in the right context could very easily be used uh, for educational purposes, yellow purposes, and so on. Um, you will want to consider what is the discussions uh, that are, what are the discussions currently going on around the game, and what discussions can we have in the classroom about that game. And more importantly, of course, do students want to play? I had one student once who just thought video games are stupid. She didn't want to play them at all. Um, she was, I believe, 72, 73 at the time. She didn't see the point. Uh, this was back in 2007. Um, and no matter what I did, I could not get her into playing until I noticed that she played Farmville on her phone. And so I engaged her with Farmville and what she does, and she ended up writing a wonderful paper about Farmville. Um, so there, there was the misconception that video games were just... Uh, you know, shooty games, Call of Duty, war type stuff, or fighting games. It didn't even cross her mind that crushing candy or having your farm on your phone, that those also count as video games, and that she could talk about those if she was passionate about them, which she did. All right, so what I'd like to do now is uh, talk a little bit about some of the video games that I'd use uh, before. I should note Previously, I had a massive list of free online games that you could use, but in 2020, uh, most browsers ended support for Flash, and these were Flash games, so a lot of these games no longer work. I had to start rebuilding my list from scratch, and so one of the games that I like to use is Elegy for a Dead World. This is one of those uh, writerly games. It's a game where you take the role of a space explorer. You've been stranded in a massive library and you have worlds to explore uh, based on the works of uh, Byron, Shelley, etc., uh, the romantic poets. And as you walk through the world let me find here we go um, as you can see here you have the option of creating a new story or editing one that's already there with uh, you know underlines and blanks and so on 
And so you actually explore the world. You stop at these uh, landmarks for the game. And then you actually have to write out the story that you want. Let's see if we can find here. All right. So here we have the explorer. He's going to stop there and towering buildings. Go ahead and add your description, however you want. Um, and then at the end of each stage, you publish what you write online for others to see. You can also read what others have written uh, in these really nice looking kind of uh, manuscripts. Let's see if we have a scene of that here we're still writing All right. it should be somewhere back here there all right and so uh, once you're done you can share your work with people from all over the world and read theirs as well uh, so you can either have your students write and publish or you can have your students read and then write a journal or reflect on what they've done so that's LG for a dead world I will post a link in the chat once I get access to it um, I also use Kind Words. Uh, this is a game that uh, students tell me has helped them immensely, perhaps more than writing, with their mental health. This is a game where if you're feeling down, you can write a letter. You send it out to the ether. And then other writers, I don't know why the video is skipping like that, and then other writers will respond to you with kind words, words of encouragement. So in this one, for example, uh, someone wrote a letter saying, I turn 40 next year and sometimes I feel like it's too late to reach my dreams. I have stories I want to tell and I worry that they'll never be good enough. This person has identified uh, themselves with D. right? And so here we can reply to D with it's never too late to reach your dreams. Baby steps are an amazing way to reach your goals. If you want to tell stories about, uh, start out by trying to write them, by writing them instead of thinking long term, think short terms, and so on and so forth. Right. So you write words of encouragement, you send them back. And if you notice down here, this add a sticker, uh, you actually have a three sets of stickers that you collect, but you get those stickers from other players responding to you. So you actually have to send out your thoughts first. Perhaps you're worried about class and COVID, right? So you send that out. You're going to get replies from people saying, you know, stay strong. Here's what you can do. This is what's worked for me. Here's a sticker, right? And so uh, this is a really great game that you can use with your students at any level. And uh, let's forward. And then we have the Westport Independent. Here we start going uh, into more uh, reader-heavy games instead of writerly games. Uh, and in this game, let's uh, skip forward the introduction here. You take the role of a newspaper editor. It's a little bit of a dark game because you are the editor for a publication in a fascist regime for the fascist party. And what the government tells you is that you need to put out propaganda to make sure that the loyalty towards the party increases. But the thing is that the party also has your family hostage. You don't like that. So your character actually wants to subvert loyalty towards the party. And your role as editor is to kind of toe the line to put out articles that don't make the party look that good while not raising any suspicions. And so to do that, you need to read the profiles of your reporters. You're the editor. You have a handful of reporter characters. You need to read the headlines and you need to edit the text. So let's see if we can find a section here where you edit. I really don't know why it's lagging so much. Um, but when you find the article, um, here in, in the game, uh, you get four lines, uh, and then you get to decide which ones to strike out and which ones to keep. Uh, so it's a really interesting uh, game and one that not only encourages reading, but that you can 
actually used to have a discussion about things like government, coercion, censorship, etc. Here we have an example on uh, how to censor, right? So one of the game's main mechanics is censoring articles. When censoring content that won't be shown to the public, it will affect their opinion of the government and so on and so forth. So when you click on each of those lines, the so ones that you don't want to publish, they get stricken out. And uh, that's how the game works. It encourages, again, uh, reading and critical thinking. So uh, another game that I use, and this is uh, one that I uh, used in my research with the first year writing students, is Logomancer. Uh, this is a game in the tradition of 16-bit uh, kind of Super Nintendo, PlayStation era role-playing games. Uh, you control a character, you explore a world, there are quote-unquote enemies, except that the enemies here are fought with things like investigation, research, and common sense. And most of the conversations that you have with other characters, like the composer, instead of them being about monsters attacking the world or whatever the case might be, uh, they are about language. So here with the composer, they have... Uh, this fairly long conversation about literal versus metaphorical language and how language is sharper than a sword. Uh, here you have a conversation about pronouns and how they're used in storytelling. Uh, here you have a conversation with a character about phonology and how language changes over time. And it's a really interesting experience. This one's actually free, unlike the previous three. Uh, this one's free, so I'll be posting a link to that one in the chat as well. And When Rivers Were Trails is also a free uh, game. Uh, this is a game written, and I explicitly use that term here, not just designed, but also written, uh, by an Anishinaabekwe a researcher who... Uh, writes about the experiences of her tribe uh, facing colonization as it was told down through generations and informed by uh, the uh, scholarship that's available today. Uh, so this is a really interesting what we call visual novel. Uh, the player has the option to, for example, resist or leave in certain events, the options to uh, gift or trade and so on, right? So you're not just reading, you are actively engaging in what uh, Arseth calls an ergodic narrative experience. Um, and then, of course, there are the games that your students are more likely familiar with, uh, you know, these quote-unquote triple A games that do have potential for the language classrooms. Uh, games like Persona 5, The Last of Us, God of War, pretty much any game that has a story you can incorporate into your class as long as you as an instructor are familiar with the game uh, are aware of what the game's underlying messages are uh, know what discussions can be had around the game and so on right um, and then we have the writerly engines that i wanted to share with you uh, this one is called rpg maker and it is a free game making engine where you can make games that are based on stories. What you see right now is the canvas where I can create a space. And I'm going to put a couple of houses here and some mountains so that it doesn't look completely empty. And if I wanted to tell a story here, what I would do is create a new event. I would give that event some kind of a visual. So I'm going to put an actor here. And then I am going to have the game show a text. Good morning. How are you today? And then I can show a choice. I'm well. Or I could be better. Sad face. And so what we've made here is a simple space where the protagonist walks around in a map and talks to this one person. So I'm going to show you what that looks like here. Uh, excuse me while I mute that sound. 
Got a mixer. And there. All right. So here we have my game. I have my character who walks around. I talk to this guy. He says, good morning. I'm doing well. Or I could be better. And depending on how much you want to get into this kind of game, you can create really immersive interactive experiences like for example uh, this one that I made for one of my graduate classes it's called the rhyme of the ancient mariner and if this line uh, reminds you of a poem the ship has cleared the harbor cleared merrily did, did we drop it's because that's line from the actual rhyme of the ancient mariner in this game you start as the wedding guest you talk to the mariner and then you get teleport it to there to the boat and in the boat you get to walk around you talk to the sailors the sailors tell you the lines from the poem eventually you stumble into an albatross which you attack and then of course we all know how that poem goes um, you know the slimes crawl from the sea and so on uh, until there is some kind of repentance right so you can make literary adaptations with RPG Maker. Uh, some have done adaptations of, for example, Romeo and Juliet, which we see here, and which I will also link uh, in the chat. There we go. The moon is already sick and pale with grief because you, Juliet, her maid, are more beautiful than she. Uh, so I'll be linking to that in the chat as well. And then you have writerly engines like Twine, which are for creating make your own adventure uh, texts, like make your own choice stories. And the way that it works is I'm going to call this one Story One. You create your passage, you wake up, and remember that you have a presentation today. And then you give the reader choices. The choices are designated by brackets. So go back to sleep or wake up and get ready. All right. Then we close that. You will notice that on our workbench, we have two options. One for going back to sleep, one for waking up and getting ready. So we can uh, further edit these passages you dose off and dream then if we want to continue adding choices we can you forget to set the alarm and dose off and miss the conference which hopefully hasn't happened to anyone or you think about it and wake up instead all right, so you can have your students continually branch out uh, and create some really compelling stories with this platform. Uh, these stories are usually hosted in uh, philome.la, which also has a Twitter account and sends them out to people. So I'm going to be linking you to this Twitter thread where you can browse uh, some in really interesting interactive fiction, works of interactive fiction. All right. Uh, as far as how I use other media in the language classroom, uh, one of the projects that I do is that students have to create something and put it out there, uh, whether that is a video game or something else. And so this group of students, this was two ELLs and one native speaker uh, who wasn't developmental. They wanted to create a video game, so they created a game where you take the role of a nurse, you find a patient in front of your house, you need to figure out if you want to treat him in front of your house or rush into the hospital or treat him in the streets. And depending on the choices that you make, uh, the game uh, takes different twists and turns. And so you can download their game from Finished Game Builds, and I will be linking to this in case you're curious of what it looks like. Uh, sometimes I have students create YouTube videos to promote their projects, like 
this one which will hopefully load now so let me pull this here this is a group of students who wanted to create a quote-unquote bionic arm uh, a mixture of ELL students Hi, and native speakers they did was that they designed a prosthetic hand that you could 3d print that YouTube video is the commercial that they had to do as part of the project um, and then they brought in the prosthetic hand to class right and then they can also use uh, social media like Twitter to engage in conversations with professionals this Twitter account is from one of those students who wanted to put out information about vaccinations for parents and so you see that here they're retweeting and replying to articles related to vaccine while also, of course, practicing uh, their language skills, right? So it's not just a question of retweeting. It's also a question of them putting out their own original information using the appropriate hashtags and so on. So when we use Twitter, um, there's also an element of media literacy that takes part in this exercise, right? So, um, Naomi, I don't know if you can see the chat, but do we have any questions or comments? In the chat, there are no questions other than please. Uh, well, somebody put an excellent, insightful presentation, a very thorough research-based proposition for so students. I greatly appreciate the many teaching activities, game recommendations, and references. All right, Dr. Awesome. Hanna left us with a bag full of tools. Great presentation. All right. Thank uh, you. This uh, one person just asking if um, he, they will get a copy of this presentation. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I will upload the file to the chat um, as soon as I get it, which I guess will be like my stop sharing. I don't know. Um, yeah, it was a great presentation, Johansson. I mean, nice. I really loved it. I mean, it's amazing. Just needs too much time to really process it. Yeah, Let me well, see if there's other uh, questions here. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, he's, uh, there's somebody who asked, Noel Casiano asked, would educators who want, who would want to include games in the classroom also learn coding? Uh, they don't need to learn coding, no. Um, you know, the most difficult that it gets as far as coding is if you want to use the writerly engine Twine, that would be uh, this one here for interactive fiction. Uh, the kind of coding that it uses is HTML adjacent, but it's actually easier. Um, so you use things like, for example... Uh, you know, these brackets here represent multiple choices. If you want to use underline, then you just use the uh, smaller than underline. And then at the end, you close as if it were an HTML tag. Or you can use things like the little asterisk to identify as italics or bold. So I'm going to show you what this looks like, that little you wake up. Uh, prompt what that looks like once it's ready so here you wake up and remember that you have a presentation today go back to sleep and wake up right so that you that we included it's the underline the uh, you know this would be the one star mark and this would be a two star mark for italics and underline but then the options that you have here is just including the two brackets like the square brackets 
at the end of either choice when you're writing. Um, and like I mentioned, you can create some really wonderful stuff with this. Uh, if you give me a second, I can uh, look up in a little bit one that I was working on with my sister some time ago. Uh, it, it can be a little bit saucy. The saucy parts were her, not me, but um, hopefully we're all adults here. Um, any other questions? No, I don't see any other questions. Everybody's just uh, very impressed with your presentation. All right, awesome, thanks. So uh, if you'll allow me, I'd like to plug my book real quick. So you can buy it on Amazon. It's called The Composition of Games. Uh, so I'll drop the link to that in the chat. Um, and then I will also include the link to a series of books called Learning Games and Education, where each volume has a uh, hundred ideas of how you can use specific games in the classroom. So for example, if you wanted to use Speech Center VR, there's a chapter for that. If you wanted to use Tales, there's a chapter for that. There's a chapter for using uh, a game for ASL and so on. So I'll be linking to those as well. And uh, if any of you want to follow up, you can always contact me at johansenquijano at gmail.com or Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube at Quijano PhD. Thank you so much, yeah, uh, Johansen. You, you did a great job and everybody's very impressed. Right. So thank you so much for uh, agreeing to participate in our conference and Anytime, have a wonderful pleasure. day. And you Please, as well. You're going to upload your presentation for us, right? Yep, for sure. I'm working on that now. Okay, great. Okay, so thank you. I saw someone raise their hand. I believe that it was Noel. I don't know if you want to open your microphone and ask if you have a question. Oh, yeah. It was pretty much um, the uh, Dr. Um, Jensen already uh, uh, like partially answered it. Uh, reason being, I, I put out that, that question about coding was uh, because uh, like my classroom experience has always been like I've, already, uh, I've tried to incorporate games. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sort of uh, reading up on game theory myself. And uh, I run into this situation where, um, you know, where, where teachers have to assess the effective level of the students, where sometimes they get, uh, you know, their emotional factor always plays into their learning. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes they get so competitive uh, in the classroom when I incorporate games that, that they sort of tend to get to a point where they get so, uh, they, their hostility factor kicks in and, and they sort of shut off to, to any additional learning. So I try to scale back on, on, mm -hmm. on sort of games and I've, I've sort of uh, started reading up more on digital narratives. Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I, I talk about coding was, uh, yes, I, I'm like, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm on board with the, uh, with the game theory uh, in the classroom as a tool for, for, for um, expanding on, on, on the student's repertoire and learning a different language. However, with coding, um, I can modify these games uh, and, and, and also make it less competitive and, and hopefully uh, help to clarify the quantification aspects in, in assessing the student's ability and grading them and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So as uh, they're not more competitive against each other but more competitive with themselves in, in, in terms of, of, of becoming more uh, proficient students yeah for sure um, I think that's where the evaluation of what games to use comes into play so uh, for example I would not have I, I would never use Fortnite in one of my classes even though it's one of the most popular if not the most popular game uh, right now um, and yes students can communicate with each other and, and there's the um, you know, spoken component and so on, but it's a game that focuses on competitiveness. There's that sense of adrenaline rush. Um, so that's not something that uh, it's going to help students really focus on language or communication, but rather they're going to be focusing on shooting each other and then the communication that happens through the open mic, that's secondary. Uh, so what I'm looking for is games that focus on uh, the language part, so language heavy games, things like role playing games or visual novels, uh, you know, like you mentioned, uh, narrative storytelling, uh, those are the kind of games that I would use. Um, as far as you using coding to change those uh, how the games work, um, legally you're not allowed to do so. Uh, there's like this really complex field of intellectual property law. Uh, but essentially, if you start doing what's called reverse engineering, you could be held liable for damages. Companies could sue you for millions of dollars, even if you're doing it for education. Uh, plus, the kind of level of coding that you would need would be some pretty hardcore uh, kind of computer engineering uh, type of level. 
um, of coding. So instead, uh, what I would recommend is if you want to have students play through a game that teaches them specific skills, uh, would be for you to learn uh, Renpy. Uh, that's one of the game engines that I use, and I will link to that in the chat in a little bit, Renpy. Uh, and then you can create your own uh, visual novels using that one. So either Renpy, Twinery, or the RPG Maker, VXA, which I just showed earlier. So that's uh, uh, Johansson, I just want to read this comment to you yep. uh, from Stephanie, I think it was. This is the the best presentation on games in the classroom that I have been privileged to view. A million thanks for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, I appreciate your kind words. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Johansson, for your amazing presentation. Not sure, anytime. Um, in the chat, I'm sharing the link for the evaluation. You should see it right now being shared. Um, please go to the link and evaluate um, our presenter. We are going to have next uh, Rosemary Morales. So we are going to give a few minutes um, for you to evaluate and then we're going to continue with our next presentation. Um, and uh, I, I should note, uh, I already uploaded the uh, links. I don't know if all of you got it. Um, and then the presentation is still uploading. It's a little bit big size-wise, so uh, you might have some problems downloading it. But I think I sent it to PRT, so not just everyone. So let me just do that again. Uh, apologies for that. So the presentation will be on a link in the chat? Or where would that be? Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to upload the file directly and then you can click on it. I, I sent it to PRT Soul instead okay. of everyone, but okay, I. Okay, that's good. Then we yeah. can send it to everybody who, Chris, who attended. Yeah. Natalia, is that correct that we could send it to them? Okay. Yes. Um, I received the document link and the presentation. So I'm, I'm going to try to download it too and right. send it to everyone that is here. All right. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Johansson. Very happy to see you again. Likewise.